Hello, everybody. Welcome to our last episode of Varsity Sports Live. The games are all finished, but we still have some hardware to hand out. Our Player of the Year edition of Varsity Sports Live is coming at you today. We'll cover all the North and South Dakota High School Players of the Year, all the honorable mentions, and the finalists. And the most exciting part is you have a role. You can vote for who you think should be the Player of the Year in each class amongst the finalists that we produce. And I've got Jody Norstedt in North Dakota standing by to just tell you exactly how you can participate. Hey, Jody. Hey, how you doing, man? Long time no see. First things first, make sure you follow us on all of our social media platforms on Midco Sports, and then go to those social media platforms after the conclusion of Varsity Sports Live tonight. That's where you'll get all the information you need to know about voting for the player of the year in each division in North Dakota, South Dakota. The voting will take place on our Instagram page for Midco Sports. And tonight we'll feature our honorable mentions, but the vote is going to be between our two finalists and the winner will receive a pretty cool trophy from us. Excited about sending those off to put a bow on our high school football season. So let's get this thing rolling, Jandy. All right, Jody, we'll bring you back in uh, later in the show, but we're going to get started in South Dakota's biggest class, which features some of the best athletes in the state. We'll start with the best defensive player that I saw this year. David Alpers faced double and triple teams constantly and fought through blockers on his way to 23 tackles for loss and nine and a half sacks. The heart and soul of the O'Gorman defense helped lead the Knights to a semifinal appearance. The future Jackrabbit also contributed with 15 receptions and 197 yards at receiver. Taylor Ashley was the most exciting player in the class. The newly minted Jefferson High School sent out the junior to be a leader on the field, and that is exactly what he did. He led them to a playoff appearance and 1,850 yards passing. He was also the team's leading rusher with 417 yards and seven rushing scores. Gabe Gutierrez burst onto the scene for the Lincoln Patriots. The junior affected the game in all three phases. He made 78 tackles, 14 of those for loss, and he punched in nine touchdowns on offense. He also blocked three punts on special teams. Gutierrez's effort helped the Patriots get all the way to the semifinals. Gavin Ross increased his workload on offense, and he responded with almost 2,000 yards rushing. Ross collected 200 yards rushing in almost half of his games, including going for 224 yards in the biggest game of the year. Ross was a fearless runner who battled through injuries to stay on the field and churn out the most yards of any AAA player. Griffin Wilde solidified his spot as the most talented receiver in the state. Wilde was the game breaker that Jefferson depended on for a successful season on offense. He averaged over 90 yards receiving per game and scored 12 touchdowns. He was also a major threat to take a kick back to the house. If he didn't kick it into the end zone, Wilde would make you pay. He had three kick returns for touchdowns this year. And now for our finalists. Both of these seniors had great careers and led their team to the championship game. Jacob Knuth did one of the hardest things to do in sports, to take a world of expectations on your shoulders and overachieve. He came into the year as one of the most celebrated quarterbacks in South Dakota history and took it in stride. And his touchdown to interception ratio was over six to one. He also was the leader in quarterback rushing yards in the state. But Jacob's collectiveness in big games made him stand out. He led a talented group of Tigers to their first AAA championship in history. Noah Thompson was the most explosive player on the Brandon Valley Lynx. He set the tone early in the season with a touchdown reception in his first game and a kick return touchdown in his second game, even though defense was his best attribute. The senior defensive back was rarely the target for opposing offenses, but he still managed eight pass breakups and an interception. Late in the season, Thompson even became more pivotal as he ended up being the starting quarterback. He had a 100-yard rushing game in the playoffs to get his team to the Dome. The future Jackrabbit is one of the toughest and most athletic players to wear a Lynx jersey. 
Pretty good list right there. I didn't realize that Jacob Knut, the future golfer, was such a good runner, Jandy. That dual threat combo makes him pretty tough to beat. Yeah, that's the one part of his game he really stepped up. Last year, his passing number is very similar, uh, but he ran the ball with force down the stretch, especially the last two games of the year. Uh, he runs a 4-6-40, and uh, he is a real force out there. But Noah Thompson, a great competitor as well, also going D1, playing defensive back for SDSU. That should be a lot of fun to see who wins that vote amongst you, the fans. All right, let's move on to 11 A, where a couple of juniors rose to the top. 121 yards for game-breaking 25 yards per reception. He's the first arrow receiver to break the 1,000-yard mark. And the senior found the end zone 14 times as he and quarterback Drew Norberg hooked up for a record-breaking season. Kale Lundin rarely had to throw the ball to win the game, but when he had to, he could light it up. The T-area quarterback led his team to an undefeated regular season after moving from receiver to quarterback. Lundin was a threat with his feet as well, powering in eight touchdowns rushing when his team needed them the most. When the Govs needed a receiver to step up this year, no one answered the call more than Jack Merklin. The junior set school records for receiving touchdowns in a season with 15, and he led the class with 1,297 yards receiving. Jack never seemed to get tired, despite running more deep routes than anyone in the state. Many were surprised to see the Aberdeen Central team make the semifinals, but those who watched Sam Rolfs all year were not. He accounted for 81% of the team's offense. He often had to create when the play broke down, and he made the most of it by running or throwing his teammates open. The future SDSU track star scored on every 7.9 carries and 5.6 completions in the Golden Eagle offense. Joe Van Overshield is the standard at linebacker in this class and has been for the last three years. He is constantly growing and learning as a leader on the defensive side for Mitchell the Colonels. He was a disruptor in the running game with 14 tackles for a loss and 85 tackles. He'll go down as one of the best defensive players to ever play for Mitchell football. Chase Van Toll led T area in rushing yards, but he did so much more for the Titans in their first year in AA. He averaged 7.8 yards per carry, trucked in nine touchdowns, and he was also their kicker who accounted for 75 points, including a 51-yard field goal. He also made 16 tackles for loss on defense as part of one of the best defensive units in the state. Those were all great players, but it was two junior quarterbacks who made their mark as the finalists in this class. Lincoln Keenholz did more than anyone could ask. The offense ran through the quarterback who took his raw athletic ability and added even more with his mental game this year to become one of the best players in the state. He broke school records at a school that's had all state quarterbacks in eight of the last nine years. And he led his team back after a 20 point deficit in the second half to win Pierce's fifth straight title. The other junior quarterback who's a finalist, Rugby Riken, probably didn't get as much recognition for his fine season, but teams that played against him realized just how good he was. He ran for almost 500 yards and threw for over 2,500. He's a very efficient passer, completing over 60% of his passes in his career and makes this electric Yankton Buck offense go. Now, Jandy, I cheated and looked at the rest of your classes. This is the only class the two finalists are juniors. The future are looking pretty bright here in this class. Yeah, a lot of times, you know, you have your best year when you're a senior. Well, these guys have already lapped the field just as juniors. I, it, I shouldn't be surprised, but every year we get younger and younger production from all these players. And uh, Rugby Riken and Lincoln Keenholz are going to be two of the best next year as well. All right, let's move on to 11A, where there were some really interesting teams and fights and storylines all year long, but in the end, the cream rose to the top. Peyton Eben became one of the best receivers that Canton has ever had. 
Stats only tell half the story. He would open things up for the rest of the team because he was such a weapon. He ran for 748 yards and collected 480 yards receiving too. He totaled 16 touchdowns, including two on returns. He also flipped the field as one of the best punters in the class. Jack Kratz of Vermillion was one of the toughest around. He helped turn the Tanagers around by simply willing his team to victory through leadership and grit. He not only moved the team down the field passing, but often punched in the touchdowns as the goal line rusher. He had 17 rushing scores this year. He also made 55 and a half tackles on defense, as well as two interceptions. Nate Rickey is a multi-threat quarterback who led Madison to an undefeated season. His coach-like understanding of the offense helped the Bulldogs dissect defenses. He ran for nearly 1,000 yards and threw for over 2,000 yards, all while limiting turnovers and finding a way to win each and every week. Landon Rusink has been one of the most dangerous players for the last two seasons. Rusink was as much of a threat out of the backfield to run as he was to break a big play receiving. He accounted for 20 touchdowns from scrimmage and helped the Quarriers get into the semifinal round of 11A in the playoffs. On defense, he had another great year as well. 48 tackles, two sacks, and a pick. After the championship game, Nate Rickey told me that his teammate Trey Smith was the best football player he's ever played with. Trey showed it in all facets of the game. He picked up an astounding 148 tackles and 18 tackles for loss this year. He was definitely the leader on defense for the Bulldogs. He's been an ultimate team player and a force since he was a sophomore for Madison. He also got big yards and scores at running back when they needed them the most. He was a kicker as well. He scored 51 points with his leg. Trey fought through several in-season injuries, but never missed a game. A couple recognizable names there. Preseason, you may have expected to see those guys at the end. They've been making their mark for a few years now, Jandy. Yeah, the teams have been good for a long time, and these players have led their teams for the last three seasons, and they look so different. Landon Rusing, kind of a little guy making big plays out of the backfield, and then Trey Smith, just a monster on defense, and he just continued to get better and better as the season went on. All right, one more 11-man class in South Dakota, Class 11B. It was dominated by winner all year, but there were several good players who made their mark. Kobe Kaiser was a difference maker on the field. He led the class in rushing yards with his strong motor and great vision at running back. He helped his team get to his third consecutive championship game as a leader on both sides of the ball. Kaiser was at his best in big games. Riley Oral was one of about 15 winner players who were good enough to be on this list, but it's Oral and his huge defensive effort in the championship game where he led his team in solo tackles that made his mark helping the Warriors win back-to-back -back titles with his grittiness and toughness on both sides of the ball. He was also the team's leader in rushing in a backfield full of studs. When you ask the coaching staff on winner who made the biggest impact on the team's success, it was a consensus, Charlie Pravacek. He was the heart and soul of their back-to-back -back titles. He was named outstanding lineman in both of their championship wins over the past two seasons. The three-year starter and team captain showed his toughness by his paint-chipped helmet and his leadership on the team. Parker Pitts put together an outstanding career at Sioux Valley. His only losses of the last two seasons were to Bridgewater Emory Ethan and to Winner. The complete quarterback could run or throw his team out of any challenge, and he proved to be one of the best defensive players in the state as well, tallying 75 tackles on defense this year. This season, he threw for 1,776 yards and ran for 839 more. He accounted for 30 touchdowns in the Cossacks offense. 
Good luck to the voters here. It's got to be hard picking guys when the numbers are hard to compare. A guy like Pravacek doesn't have the numbers like Pitts, but both pretty outstanding in their own ways, Jandy. Yeah, Pravacek, you know, a lineman, it's hard to put numbers on what you do up front, but he didn't lose a game as the team leader over the last two years. And then you got Parker Pitts. I mean, just the prototype quarterback who did everything for Sioux Valley, and uh, he had quite a career himself. So, yeah, good luck to the voters is right. Uh, that's it for 11-man football in South Dakota. We're going to come back and show you our three nine-man classes in South Dakota and stay with us. We've got a lot more coming up from North Dakota after this as well. Varsity Sports Live on Midco Sports is presented by Avera Orthopedics and South Dakota State University. Varsity Sports Live on Midco Sports is presented by Farmers Union Insurance. Thanks for staying with us for our Varsity Sports Live Players of the Year special. We've covered all the 11-man classes in South Dakota. Time to get into nine-man football where there are three classes starting with 9AA. This is a class with a lot of talent and we featured a lot of different players on our honorable mention list. Ashton Hansen was an absolute workhorse and put Florence Henry football on the map over the past two seasons. He broke off at least one long run per game and ended up averaging 11.1 yards per carry to lead his team into the playoffs. Dylan Kent rewrote the Garrettson single season record book this year, breaking five records, along with establishing the career passing record for the Blue Dragons. He accounted for 35 touchdowns and a team that averaged 31 points per game. He was also a leader on the defensive side. He had nine interceptions, which was also a single season record in Garrettson. Dylan's intelligence and knack for making big plays were a huge success factor for the Garrettson Blue Dragons this year. If there's one player in the state who probably didn't get enough pub, it's Hank Kraft of Timber Lake. He's a next level athlete and he tore up the class with over 2,000 yards rushing and 28 touchdowns. He ended up his career with 80 scores. He made big play after big play to keep his team in contention, including a dramatic game winning touchdown in the playoffs. There's two big time seniors left as the finalists in this class. Stratton Eppert was unbelievable on offense this year. He ran for over 100 yards per game at quarterback and also threw for 1,294 yards. But for as good as his offensive numbers were, he was just as good on defense. The senior leader led Chester to one of their best seasons in recent years. He's a team captain and one of the most dynamic players to play nine-man football. Grayson Hansen is a humble athlete who absolutely crushes it on the football field. The senior helped his team to consecutive state titles this fall, including three road playoff wins before getting to the Dome. He was at his best on defense, which is saying a lot because he was stellar on offense too. He made 152 tackles, including 14 tackles for loss and forced an unbelievable 10 fumbles on defense. Offensively, the versatile back could pass, catch, or run whatever you needed him to do. He is Platt Geddes' smartest player on the field, and he would make his own calls based on watching film or scouting the opponent by himself. Ten forced fumbles. you got to be kidding me. We see a lot of versatile players on this show, Jandy, but not many more versatile than those two finalists. Yeah, exactly. That's the name, the name of the game in nine-man football, isn't it? You have to be able to do a little bit of everything, and these two were the best players on the field almost every time they stepped between the lines. And, uh, uh, again, a really tough decision for people to make between Stratton Neppard and Grayson Hansen. All right, let's move on to 9A. Uh, this was a field with four undefeated teams in the Final Four. Of course, there's going to be a ton of great players to talk about. Kalen Gary powered DeSmet to an undefeated regular season. He averaged 15.7 yards per carry because of his home run hitting ability whenever he got the football. He gained over 1,100 yards from scrimmage and he only played in 23 quarters this season. 
despite missing a game and a half due to injury, Carson Kerwan still managed to rush for 1,418 yards and 18 touchdowns. The Castlewood Jr. did whatever it took to keep his team competitive, including changing positions, learning new formations, and leading on both sides of the ball. He's one of the most athletic backs in 9A. Harriet Selby area's Trey Saylor has the bluest collar in nine-man football. He sacrifices his body as the lead blocker in an explosive offense. Saylor does a lot of the dirty work getting his team down the field on offense and is one of the best tacklers in the state. The leader of the Nasty Nine on defense set the tone on their trip to the Dome this year. Howard's Jace Cypher changed multiple positions this year. Last year's center nose guard fluidly moved to tight end where he was a great blocker and defensive end on defense where he set the edge and made big plays. Cypher is headed to SDSU next season, but Howard fans will remember him taking over half of his receptions and turning them into touchdowns. Dismet's Colt Wilkinson was the centerpiece of the Bulldogs' success in 2021. He contributed in all three phases, quarterback, linebacker, and was tough on special teams as well. He threw for 1,200 yards and ran in nine touchdowns and once again was the team leader in defensive tackles for the third consecutive year. Our finalists had standout seasons and took their respective teams to the Dome. We'll start with Brendan Begaman, the two-time All-State player who's just a junior. He's an A-plus athlete who gained over 2,000 yards from scrimmage with 33 touchdowns. Teams had to shy away from throwing the ball in his direction, but he still made them pay. He had 12 interceptions on defense and also forced three fumbles and returned three balls on defense into the end zone. He was a terrorizing defensive back. Ty Byer was tenacious. He brought that tenacity to his blocking and especially to his tackling. He set the record for tackles at Howard in a single season with 173. He actually broke his dad's record, Greg, in the tackling department. Byer shared the load in the backfield as well, and he did just as much damage. In the championship game, he needed just four carries to bust through the century mark. He ended the year with 957 yards and a 10.6 yards per carry average. Byer was one of the toughest players in the toughest class in nine-man football. Jandy, sometimes it's easy to forget all the great players, especially when they don't make it to the title game. 9A was absolutely stacked this year. This had to be one of the tougher lists to put together. Uh, by far, Jody. I mean, we're talking about four really great teams that made it to the finals and or to the final four. And then even before that, plenty of great players like Carson Kerwan and, and, and guys who I, I feel like could maybe make this list next year. So a lot of talent in 9A to go through. And uh, it's going to be tough again to vote on who should win that award. All right, last but not least, Class 9B, South Dakota's smallest class with some big-time talent. Brady Birama of Avon brought the Pirates back. He led his team to an undefeated regular season and the number one seed going into the playoffs. He ran 192 times for 1,954 yards and 28 touchdowns on the ground. He added four more receiving and played well on defense as well. Jovi Christensen of Alcester Hudson had a record-breaking season. The highlight of his season, a 547-yard rushing game with nine touchdowns to set the nine-man record in both cases. He ended up the year with 1,700 yards rushing and averaged 9.6 yards per carry. Del Rapids St. Mary senior John Pika made his mark on defense, where he led the team in tackles, forced fumbles, and fumble recoveries. His pick six in the title game sparked St. Mary to their first championship in school history. The four-year starter was a centerpiece in the offensive line as well. Their rushing game gained nearly 3,000 yards on the ground behind John Pika's leadership. 
Grant Lukens raised the level of his play and helped the Potter County Battlers get to the championship game. He's been a starting quarterback since his freshman year, but injuries and illness have prevented him from reaching his full potential until this year. He was a true dual threat quarterback every time he took a snap. He showcased that when he threw for almost 300 yards and four touchdowns in the final game and also ran for two touchdowns. On defense, he led the Battlers with 84 tackles and also made two interceptions. The smallest schools in the state, Jandy, but still some big time talents from these teams. Yeah, honestly, at the beginning of the year, we do our preseason player of the year. And this is the one class I'm like, I'm not sure who's going to emerge, who's going to, if they're going to have enough talent to, to bubble up to the top. Well, by the end of the year, we found some big time talented players, even though these schools are very small. All right, going to be tough to vote for, for all those classes, all seven of them in South Dakota. Well, coming up next, an ode to the injured players, a salute to a 2,000-yard rusher, and much more. I'll unveil our top players in North Dakota's four classes when Varsity Sports Live returns. Varsity Sports Live on Midco Sports is presented by Avera Orthopedics and South Dakota State University. Welcome back, everyone. The top division in North, in North Dakota, that 11 AA class, really ended up being East heavy. Obviously, a lot was made about how Davies was officially eliminated early in the season because they started 0-2 in region play, yet they went a perfect 4-0 against teams from the West. And then we had an All-East State Championship for the first time since 2005, with West Fargo and Cheyenne meeting in the big game for the first time ever. That's not to say there wasn't talent spread across the state, though. The unfortunate part being that we didn't get to see one of the best players in state history finish out his career with Bismarck running back Isaiah Hoos, who was a player of the year finalist last year. Well, he had season-ending surgery the first week of September. But the show must go on, and here's a look at the guys we pegged as our top players in 11 AA. We start with the honorable mentions, and it's quite the crew. Let's begin with Shanley senior receiver and defensive back John Gores. The NDSU commit could probably reach out and catch a 90-mile-per-hour fastball with his football gloves if you asked him to. Gores finished the season with an EDC best 88 catches for 1,200 yards and 10 touchdowns. He earned a game ball when he caught a school record 21 passes for 263-2 and two against Jamestown. John was fun to watch this season. There's no stat to quantify attention drawn, but there wasn't a defensive coordinator all year that didn't lose sleep, trying to game plan for 16 in green and white. Still, West Fargo senior Carson Hegerly managed to catch 40 passes for 769 yards and five touchdowns. The future Bison also shut down half the field on defense and made three field goals and 38 extra points. Hegerly played a massive role in getting the Packers to the state championship game. Cheyenne's Josh Hendricks earned his spot on the list by getting five yards of carry almost every time he touched the ball, which was 275 times, by the way. Cheyenne's Bell Cow finished with over 1,400 rushing yards and 23 scores. They rode him in the championship game. Hendricks turned 39 carries into 238 and three. Hungry, hungry Hendricks was a beast. Mandan's Carson Jablonski led the WDA in receiving by a mile finishing with 55 catches for over 1,000 yards and seven scores. He also added a couple of kick returns for touchdowns, four interceptions, and a couple of forced fumbles as the Braves finished second in the WDA. This next young man was selected as Senior Athlete of the Year, and it's hard to argue. Century's Lucas Schweigert has quite the resume with a couple of state titles and the fact that he's anchored some of the best offensive and defensive lines in state history as a four-year starter on the O-line and a three-year starter on the defensive front for the Patriots. The future Fighting Hawk racked up 54 tackles and two sacks on defense this fall. Now to our Player of the Year finalists, starting with Shanley running back Aiden Devine. The Deacon offense is built for big numbers, but even with that in mind, Devine's season was remarkable. He goes for over 1,300 rushing yards and makes 67 catches for another 540 yards, reaching the end zone 17 times. He was not only the second leading rusher in the state, but he also caught the second most passes in 11 AA. A player as tough as nails, and he earns a finalist spot. He'll go head to head against the guy who ended up leading the state in rushing with 1,650 yards and 24 touchdowns, West Fargo's Parker Nelson. After the Packers started one and two, Nelson in the ground game exploded for yards in bulk like they were shopping at Costco. 
He had seven straight games of 150-plus rushing yards, including a trio of 230-plus yard games. His offensive line and fullback Josh Balstead played a huge part in the success too, but Nelson also played a critical role on defense when they needed him, making 38 tackles, including eight tackles for loss. Congrats to Nelson and Devine on being our two finalists. Hmm, Jody, let me get this straight. So Cheyenne wins it all. You got two EDC players who have played against the Mustangs all year long. What do you say to the Mustang fans, Jody? Right? Sorry? Okay, here's the deal. Cheyenne, bar none, had the most complete team in the state. So sometimes the individuals don't stand out as much and, you know, garner awards like this. Grant Workentine, Cheyenne's quarterback, just wrapped up one heck of a career. He finished 31-2 and two as a starter with the two losses coming in the Dakota Bowl. But in the Mustangs offense, quarterback never really the star. He just didn't get a whole lot of opportunities to throw. But we obviously, obviously saw him gash teams with his legs down the stretch and leading them to the state title. Henricks, you saw him on my honorable mention list. Great physical back. I just think the two finalists probably played a bigger part in their team's success overall. It was tough for me to decide between Gores and Devine for Shanley, who deserved to be a finalist. Two outstanding talents for that team. Also, I found this interesting. Last year, our two finalists were from the West. Century's Andrew Langang and Bismarck's Isaiah Hoots. Now we have an all-East matchup. All right, let's go to my 11A group where we had plenty of playmakers step up and shine this season. I trimmed my honorable mention list down to five in 11A, and it's a solid group, starting with my preseason player of the year, Troy Berg, who left it all on the field for Dickinson this year, leading the team in passing, rushing, and finishing among the top tacklers in the conference, all while facing one of the toughest schedules in 11A. Berg combined for 1,500 yards of offense in his nine games played, scoring 14 touchdowns. He also added nearly 60 tackles and accounted for seven turnovers on defense, along with a couple of blocked kicks. Daniel Boutain, quarterback north to its best season since Y2K was a thing. Kids, look it up. Boutain passed for close to 1,800 yards and combined for 22 scores. He's a leader through and through, and we also learned he's a great trumpet player. He won't toot his own horn, but we will. Isaac Felkley did so much on both sides of the ball for Dan Smeeker's St. Mary's squad. 900 rushing yards and 13 scores to go with over 100 tackles on defense, including 14 for loss. Felkley guided the Saints to their second straight Dakota Bowl appearance. Wapiton's air raid offense helped the Huskies put up record-setting numbers, and receiver Caden Kappas was a huge beneficiary. It's not too often you see a high school receiver catch 19 touchdown passes. He averaged nearly two per game, but he was busy on defense too, making 75 tackles, eight of them for lots. St. Mary's safety and receiver Britt Sentner recently made a verbal commitment to play football at NDSU, and the Bison are getting quite the talent. Sentner is a three-year starter, and this is his second year starting both ways. The Coast Senior Athlete of the Year finished with 500 receiving yards and 93 tackles, 12 for loss from his safety spot. He also made some big plays in the state championship game with a touchdown catch and an interception. Now to our pair of finalists. Jamestown receiver and defensive back Adam Kallenbach was the most valuable player on the best team in 11A. He made 42 catches for 719 yards this season to go with the nine touchdown grabs, most of which were of the highlight reel variety. He did that work with changing faces at quarterback due to injury. Then on defense, he made several game-changing plays with nine interceptions, many of those turnovers coming in critical spots against tough competition. Kallenbach is a gamer, and he's a finalist for our Player of the Year award. Oddly enough, he never got to face the guy he's facing in the voting. Wapiton's Blake Schaefer, recently named Co-Senior Athlete of the Year, ended up passing for a Class A best and school record, 2,752 yards and 32 touchdowns. He also rushed in seven more scores. After winning just one game as sophomore and junior seasons combined, he led the Huskies to five wins and a playoff berth as a senior. I don't know if you noticed there, Jody, but I saw the ball in the air quite a bit. You mentioned seven guys. We had three quarterbacks, three receivers. What does that say about this class? Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Wapton and Jamestown really passed the ball a ton this year, so their numbers were going to be huge. Blake Schaefer throwing for nearly 3,000 yards, though. 
That is insane. Congrats to the Huskies on a great year. Troy Berg was a converted running back, so he was pretty much their entire offense, whether he was running or passing. If Dickinson would have had a more balanced schedule, I feel his numbers would have been even more impressive, but they played a ton of tough teams this year. My toughest decision in this one came down to Kallenbach and Semfner, two outstanding players for me, though. Kallenbach just made so many explosive plays, game-changing plays, and give Jamestown credit. The Blue Jays beat St. Mary's twice this fall. All right, let's check out 11B, where I had a junior crack my finalist pairing. Take a look. I felt going into the season that 11B would be the most competitive, and that's exactly what happened. The state poll was constantly in flux with a crop of great talent, which ended up making my job extremely difficult for this list. Let's give a few of the guys that were on the bubble of making this honorable mention list a shout out. I'm thinking Dean Vetter over at Linton HMB, Zach Hendrickson and Jet Lundeen from Bishop Ryan, Amari Gilmore and Trapper Skalski from Beulah, Central Cass's Owen Wiersma is another. We start with Owen's squirrel teammate, the Region 1 Senior Athlete of the Year, Jake Deutsch, who caught 41 passes for 891 yards and 16 touchdowns. He also made 51 tackles and intercepted a couple of passes when teams decided that throwing his way was a good idea. From the state runner-up, senior Jace Leshick gets the nod after averaging a whopping nine yards per carry during his 1,000-yard rushing season. He scored 18 combined touchdowns and was the second leading tackler on one of the best defenses in the state. I know Grafton struggled as a team this year, but Esger Rio still put up numbers worthy of consideration. Of the nine opponents on the spoiler schedule, six made the playoffs. Still, Rios combined for over 1,000 yards of offense and reached the end zone 12 times. Then on defense, he was busy, making an incredible 103 solo tackles, 21 tackles for loss, including 10 sacks and a pair of picks. He ends his career as a rare four-time All-State selection. Kayla Brist of Deluxe Burlington had to shoulder the load for the Lakers after quarterback Carson Yale went down. Riss churned out 1,500 yards and 18 touchdowns to go with solid numbers defensively. Madden Thorson earned Senior Athlete of the Year honors after a senior campaign of 55 catches for 1,100 yards and 14 total touchdowns for Harvey Wells County, a lot of that with teams double teaming him. He shut down half the field in the passing game every Friday night on defense too, something that won't pop up on the stat sheet. As for our two finalists, we're going with two guys that clashed in the state semis. Let's start with Bowman County receiver and safety Clay Heimer. He put up huge numbers in that offense, erupting for 102 catches, 1,500 yards, and 18 end zone trips. He also added 67 tackles from his safety spot. Without Heimer, they don't reach the final four. On the other side, junior running back and linebacker Trey Heinrich led Kindred to its first state title, rushing for 1,300 yards on seven yards a pop. He combined for 28 offensive touchdowns on the season and also dominated defensively, recording 72 tackles, seven interceptions, and scoring twice on that side of the ball. Heinrich should have the Vikings back in contention next fall. I feel you, Jody. These lists are incredibly hard to make. You even mentioned some that didn't quite make the honorable mention. But uh, what did you? Why did you land on Heinrich and Heimer? Because both their names start with H, and yeah, my son course. Harrison's name starts with an H, right? No. Obviously, their numbers, Jandy, speak for themselves. They were both electric offensively. Heimer with the 18 receiving touchdowns, and Heinrich with the 28 total touchdowns. But these are two guys that play great on defense too. And we talked about the versatility earlier in the show they do so much for their teams and both I believe maxed out their team's potential Bowman County surprised me a bit this year with Heimer I think they grabbed everyone's attention when they took down Beulah in the regular season finale then they made a run to the semifinals Quade Lardy and Heimer had a great connection and then of course Kindred winning it all Heinrich kept things steady all year even when quarterback Max McQuillan had to miss some games in the middle of the year because he was sick uh, boy, he was uh, played really well. Heinrich really carried the load. Might have a chance to, if he wins it this year, he might be able to repeat again next year. So how impressive would that be? Well, 9B had 40 teams in it this year, eight divisions, so plenty of stats to sift through as I narrow down my list. Here you go. Full disclosure, Class 9B was by far my toughest to make cuts on, so much so that I needed two pages of honorable mentions. So I'm going to go through these a little quicker. Wyatt Carabello's monster numbers for Divide County speak for themselves. 20 touchdowns and 14 tackles for loss on the year. Tyson Ingett was probably a whisker away from being a player of the year finalist. The good news for him 
He'll have another shot next year as a senior and get passed for 1,000 yards, rushed for 600, and added another 200 through the air, accounting for 33 combined touchdowns. He scored in every way imaginable and had the outlaws within a touchdown of advancing to the quarters. Grant County Flashers' Jace Freeze battled injuries this fall and led the Storm to not one, but two road playoff wins. He also led an offense that scored more points than any other team this year against the state champs, Lamore Litchville Marion. Several coaches told me they were super impressed with Cavaliers' Trevor Hinkle this fall. The senior combined for 14 touchdowns on offense and made 128 tackles on defense. Brady Lettenmeyer followed in the footsteps of Brett Wendell nicely for the Lobos. He rushed for 1,800 yards and 23 touchdowns while also making 12 tackles for loss on defense. Lettenmeyer capped off his standout junior year by rushing for 210 and a touchdown in the state championship win. Jace Nelson was the most explosive receiver in the state. He turned nearly half of his 43 catches into touchdowns. He finished with 1,100 receiving yards and averaged an astounding 26 yards per catch. The Outlaws are going to miss him. Nobody ever seemed to learn not to kick it to Dylan Rood of New Salem Almont. He scored four times on kick returns and once on a punt. That's not to mention his 16 offensive touchdowns. He was a workhorse for the Holsteins. This next one is an important one. Napoleon Gackle Streeter's Tucker Schneider put up these stats despite going down with an injury in the first half of their sixth game on the schedule. He averaged 320 yards of offense and nearly five touchdowns a game. He was on pace for player of the year consideration before the injury. And speaking of injury, quick shout out to Winemere Lidgewood's Andrew Arth, who topped 150 yards rushing against both nine-man Dakota Bowl teams before having his season ended prematurely because of injury. Back to Holstein country for Ty Wolding, who passed for 1,200 yards and 19 touchdowns and added 700 rushing yards and 17 more scores. The Holsteins were inches away from playing for a state title. Nathan Kaufman of Mont Regent, New England won a game ball this year. He was a one-man wrecking crew, running, throwing, catching, and tackling for the wildfire. 2,500 yards of offense and 34 touchdowns. Insert fire emoji. What a season. Now to our two finalists for Player of the Year, starting with Chris Jenner. The Surrey running back and defensive end was our preseason Player of the Year, and he delivered an outstanding senior campaign, averaging over a first down per carry in route to 2,300 rushing yards and 24 scores. He was nearly as impressive defensively, finishing with 20 tackles for loss, including five sacks. Jenner led the Mustangs into the quarterfinal round, and they were a touchdown away from advancing to the Final Four. His opponent will be the quarterback from the state champs. Corbin Potts passed for nearly 1,800 yards and boasted an outstanding touchdown to interception ratio of 29 to two. That's not even including his eight rushing scores, three of which came in the state championship win. Potts in that offense averaged 50 points per game and he lost just one game as the starting quarterback over the past two seasons. Another outstanding field of players. I don't know how you did it, Jody. There's so many good players in nine-man football, and I'm sure all the nine-man fans could make a case for their guy, and you'd listen, but you're the one that gets to make that call. How did you come up with these two? Yeah, lucky us, right? Yeah. I think anyone who's watched Chris Jenner play and seen the numbers he's put up, I mean, they – he has to be one of the best players in nine-man history. The combination of 20 tackles for loss and 2,300 rushing yards doesn't happen too often. The other spot was tough, though. I'm sure I have several fan bases upset with me, but that's the nature of having to make these lists and choose finalists. When it came down to it for me, Corbin Potts put up big numbers, 1,800 passing yards, 29 touchdowns, and only turned it over two or three times. He was the leader of an offense that averaged 50 points per game, ran the table, and won a state title. Teams would double-team some of the Lobo receivers, which would open up huge lanes for the running back, Brady Lettenmeyer, who I also had as an honorable mention for what he was able to do. And I think either of the Ray Powers Lake players could have probably been a finalist. And I had a few coaches tell me Cavaliers Trevor Hinkle was probably the toughest player they coached against. So a case could be made for him to, in the end, a lot of great options. I settled on Jenner and Potts, a couple of great ones. A reminder, voting is now open. Head on over to midcoastsports.com to learn more. When we come back, our send-off for the season on Varsity Sports Live. Jandy and I will say our heartfelt goodbyes, and we have some top plays to show you as well. Stick around. 
Varsity Sports Live on Midco Sports is presented by Farmers Union Insurance. Oh, hey, hey guys, welcome back. I'm just, uh, I'm into my voting already, Jody, and I know how to vote, but you better remind everybody else how to get involved. Uh, you better not be voting for yourself. Is it me? I'm voting for you? the North Dakota guys because I already, I, I already have my votes in for South Dakota. <laughs> yeah. So you go to any of our social media platforms, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, uh, there should be a post up that you can just click on and that'll give you all the information of where to vote. The voting will actually take place on our Midco Sports Instagram page. So make sure to take a look. A lot of worthy candidates to, to select from between the two finalists in each class, but it, it should be a lot of fun. I'm sure we'll get people that chime in. You know, Jandy and Jody don't know much of anything, but whatever, all right? We get paid to do something, right? That's right. <laughs> we get we, paid to get yelled at. Honestly, anyways. Yeah, I wouldn't have it any other way. I just, yeah, we just do but our this best. Was a, this was a fun season, pal. Uh, appreciate all the help from from you guys down south. And Tom too is not with us tonight, but uh, uh, another fun year of Varsity Sports Live. Always a good time, and uh, can't wait to do it again next fall. You bet. All right. Well, we will send you off tonight with the top plays from North Dakota throughout the season. Uh, take a look and. We'll see you next year, everyone.